Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you here this morning. We've got a Reformation music uh, extravaganza. So we have the choir sing our prelude. We've got our all school sing. And we've got some of our youth playing with our first hymn, which is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Why? Yeah. A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Hymn, we're singing hymn 657 because it's a little easier for the instruments to play than 656. So we're going to begin by singing hymn 657, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Please stand.
We follow the order of Matins, found on page 219 of your hymnals. O Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We will now speak Psalm 46 responsively, half verse by half verse, which can be found in the front part of your hymnal. Psalm 46, half verse by half verse. God is our refuge and strength. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though its waters roar and foam. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. The mountains rage, the kingdoms totter. The Lord of hosts is with us. Come, behold the works of the Lord. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. Be still and know that I am God. The Lord of hosts is with us. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we continue with our all school sing.
All right, have a seat right where you are, friends. Do we have any other friends that want to come up here for a special message? Well, good morning, friends. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning and hear your voices as we sing praises to God on this Reformation Sunday. Does anyone here know what a pastor is supposed to be doing? Ethan? Teaching? Teaching people about how to learn about God? Yeah, that's a good answer. Preaching? Preaching God's Word? Yes. You guys have some good answers. He's to, to preach God's word, teach God's word. He's to lead people in worship, especially, you know, can lead us in offering sacrifices, especially sacrifices financially or sacrifices uh, in our prayers. And we're supposed to lead us in prayer. In the Old Testament, this was the job of the priests. In our epistle reading, our second reading this morning, we hear that Jesus is our great high priest. He came to proclaim God's word. He came to be the ultimate sacrifice on the cross for each of us, and he prays for you. This is why we call Jesus our great high priest. He died on the cross to forgive you all your sins. He rose from the dead. He sits before God on the throne, and he intercedes for you and me. He prays for you and me. He loves you, and he cares for you. Pastors are supposed to reflect this truth in their job to you. Share God's word with you so that you believe. Lead you in worship so that you can honor Jesus and what he did for you. And pray with you and pray for you so that you can lay your cares and your worries at the feet of Jesus. And when they do these things, they're not supposed to be pointing out themselves. They're to point you to Jesus, your great high priest. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for sending Jesus to be our great high priest who offered himself as a sacrifice for us and laid down his life on the cross for us and is interceding for us on our behalf. We pray that you would guide all pastors that they may reflect that truth that Jesus is our great high priest. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks, friends. You can return to your seats or you can follow Mr. Anniker to Kids Church. We continue our worship by singing hymn 555, Dear Salvation Unto Us Has Come, the first five verses.
The Old Testament lesson for the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost is from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 7 through 9, which can be found on page 839 of your pew Bibles. In our Old Testament reading, the prophet Jeremiah exhorts the people of Judah to cry out to the Lord to save the remnant of God's chosen people. The prophet then promises that God will bring peoples who are broken in various ways from all the ends of the earth to be gathered in one place and receive his blessings. We read, For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the pregnant woman, and she who is in labor, together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with pleas for mercy I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water, in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. O Lord, have mercy on us. The epistle is from Hebrews, the seventh chapter, verses 23 through 28, which can be found on page 1288 of your pew Bibles. In our epistle reading, the writer to the Hebrews teaches the superiority of Jesus Christ's priesthood compared to the former priests, who are limited by their mortality. The writer also says that Jesus can save completely, unlike the priests who came before, because he is without sin and interceding for us in heaven itself. We read, The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weaknesses as high priests. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. O Lord, have mercy on us. Please stand for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 46 through 52, which can be found on page 1083 of your pew Bibles. In our gospel reading, a blind beggar comes up to Jesus, repeatedly asking for mercy, even when he is rebuked by others. Jesus then asks him what he wants him to do for him, and he desires to regain his sight. The man's faith immediately made him well. We read, And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. O Lord, have mercy on us. We continue with our common responsory on page 221. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens.
Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When you study the Old Testament and biblical theology, it doesn't take long to see that God established three important offices for his Old Testament people. These important offices were were meant to lead God's people through different times in their history. The important offices were prophet, priest, and king. Now, we believe and confess that Jesus came to fulfill the entire Old Testament. And that means we should see how Jesus came to fulfill these roles and how he's the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. Prophets were God's appointed proclaimers of his message. They were to speak God's word to his people and later on in the history of Israel to their kings especially many times when they're disobeying God. It's easy to see the connection of Jesus fulfilling the role of prophet. Not only did he come to fulfill the the prophet's words, he was the great teacher, the great rabbi. He taught things like the golden rule or shared amazing parables. And he even did mighty works similar to some of the prophets. Kings became the leaders of God's people. Although the desire for a king was one that was a rebellion against God, God provided his Old Testament people with kings. King David was the great king of Israel, and all good kings are compared to him after their reign. King David was so important that we hear promises that the shoot from the stump of Jesse would come, that the righteous branch of David and the son of David would rule forever. Of course, the ultimate son of David is Jesus, a descendant in both Matthew and Luke's Gospels, genealogies of Jesus. Jesus came as a ruler over the whole world who promises that he rules at the right hand of God into eternity. He is the son of David, the king of kings. Now those roles were easy to understand of how Jesus fit into them. But what about Jesus as our great high priest? That was a trickier question. After all, to be a priest meant that you had to be born into the right family. Much like a king, a priest had to be born as a tribe of Levite. But Jesus was no Levite. He was the son of David, which made him a descendant of Judah. Now, the book of Hebrews actually lays out a convincing case of how Jesus can be your great high priest. Our text from Hebrews 7 gives us the impressive things that makes Jesus your great high priest. He isn't like the Old Testament priest that died and stayed dead. He is the ultimate priest who rose from the dead, never needing another priest again. But there's still that birthright issue. The book of Hebrews finds a a little story in the story of Abraham in Genesis. Abraham offered a tithe to the king of Salem, and that would later be known as Jerusalem. This king was also a priest of the Most High God. This kingly priest was named Melchizedek. Most of the Old Testament seems to just ignore this little interaction. But Psalm 110 has an interesting reference to Melchizedek. Hebrews picks up on this trend. Psalm 110 actually contains the most quoted verse of the Old Testament in the New Testament. This psalm is very messianic in nature. It identifies the promised Savior, the greater son of David, the King of Kings, 
the prophet greater than Moses would be the great high priest by the order of Melchizedek. This is how, even though Jesus' birthright has no claim to be his, a priest, he came to be the high priest, the ultimate go-between between God and man by the order of Melchizedek. Biblical theology can show us great theological treatises about the importance of Jesus, and especially him being prophet, priest, and king. Hebrews de Hebrew 7 demonstrates that Jesus is our great high priest that is high above in the heavens. But what does that do have to do with you today? Let's answer that question by beginning with another question. Has anyone here ever made a big mistake? Now, don't raise your hand, okay? All right? That would probably be a big mistake, right, Vicar? Oh, look at me. I made. We've all made mistakes. We've all made big mistakes. A mistake that just freaked you out. A mistake that you said, oh, no, how can I ever get past this? It might be something you did unintentionally, that you didn't realize how big of a mistake it was until it was too late. It could be something you did intentionally. Something you look back on and you regret that you would have ever done something like that. But either way, now it's happened. And just thinking about it sends your anxiety through the roof. It makes you feel like the roof is caving in on you. Your breathing becomes shallower. Self-doubt creeps in. And how could I, we ask? But the harder question we wrestle with is, how can I overcome this mistake? Now, the scary thing is, with most mistakes, we can't overcome them on our own. Some people will try to weasel their way out, and they might lie or cover it up or blame someone else. That way, they don't have to admit to their mistakes. But when it comes to our major mistakes, the ones that I've made, I can't undo them on my own. I need someone's help, which means I have to tell someone else my major mistake. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to be your high priest by offering himself on the cross. The priest's main job was to offer sacrifices. Sacrifices that would appease God and ultimately lead to the sacrifice once for all. But people have always needed help when they've made mistakes. They need to admit their mistakes. They most importantly need those mistakes forgiven. Jesus is the Lamb of God on the cross forgives every mistake that haunts you. Jesus came to offer forgiveness for that mistake that just happened. Jesus died on the cross to forgive you for those times when your anxiety goes through the roof as you remember them. As your great high priest, Jesus came to hear your mistakes and to offer you a better message. Jesus came to be the one who can forgive you all your sins, all your mistakes. Just as God promised to accept those Old Testament sacrifices, we know that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice for your sins because he raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus holds the title of great priest because he lives forever. God has wiped away that mistake in the blood of the Lamb, and it should never haunt you again. And one day, God promises that those memories will be wiped away for good because Jesus came to be your great high priest. As your high priest, it also means that Jesus is interceding for you. Hebrews writes, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And this was the second big role of the priests. They were to intercede for God's people. There are two main ways to think about Jesus' intercession for you. The first is that when you make another mistake, God is righteously angry. But there is Jesus interceding for you, saying, God, remember what I did for him. Remember how I loved her. And he's showing his father his nail marks in his hands and his pierced side and saying, it is finished. It is forgiven. But the second way is to think of it this way. Maybe you've just had one of those days, one of those weeks, maybe even one of those months, 
Nothing seems to go right. No one's in your corner. Life seems against you. Your life is a house of cards and it's crumbling down to nothing. It could be a dreadful disease. It could be an issue that most people don't, can't, or won't understand. It could be an ongoing problem that doesn't seem to have a good solution on this side of eternity. It's one of those things. And so you decide to pray to God. God! And then nothing comes out. So you say, God, what I meant to say is, and just guttural sounds come out, but no actual words. At worst, what comes out are tears, anger, despair, and silence. And it seems that as you pray more, it only gets worse. You can't even pray. But you, You have a great high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He is interceding for you. He's saying to you, I hear your prayer. Let me pray for you. Let me fill those words. Let me cry aloud to my Father with those nail marks. And Jesus intercedes for you. He prays for you. When you can't say those words, Jesus, your high priest, says, I got this and he prays for you. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when we talk about biblical theology like this idea of prophet, priest, and king, it's never simply an academic exercise. It means something to us as Christians. It tells you something about Jesus. And most importantly, it shows you how important you truly are to the creator of the universe, the savior of the world, and to your great high of how much he truly loves you, forgives you, and intercedes for you. And nothing is ever going to change that. In the name of Jesus, amen. We now conclude hymn 555, uh, verses 6 through 10, Salvation unto us has come.
We remain standing as we confess together the words of the Apostles' Creed found on the back cover of your hymnals. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Hence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with our canticle, hymn 941. We praise you and acknowledge you, O God. may be seated as we continue with our offering.
And we remember in our prayers this week, Marlene Vogt, who was hospitalized this past week, and uh, Dakota, that's Phil's grandson, who suffered from com uh, complications with surgery, and uh, the family of Matt Brunn. Please stand for the Kyrie. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For behind us the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. O oh God, the helper of all who call on you, have mercy on us and give us eyes to faith, of faith to see your Son that we may follow him on the way that leads to eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. O oh Lord, you have saved your people, the remnant of Israel, which is your church. Continue to preserve that same church so that you may gather all peoples from the farthest places of the earth into your holy kingdom, which has no end. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, the faith in you that has been so graciously granted to us has made us well in all things. Help us to always keep our newly opened eyes upon you so that we may continue steadfast in that saving faith. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you established your Son, Jesus Christ, as our great High Priest, an office which will endure forever. Send us your Spirit that we may draw near to him so that we may continue to be cleansed from all our sins and saved to the uttermost. Lord, in your mercy. King of glory, all our earthly blessings come from your provision. Restore the fortunes of our land, households, and businesses in accordance with your perfect will, so that we may rejoice in your holy name. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, you raised up your servant Martin Luther to preach your saving gospel against authorities that would have your truth be silenced. Give us that same heart of courage that we may proclaim boldly the power of the cross of your son, Jesus Christ, against the world that scorns all godly teaching. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, you establish all earthly princes for our safety, stability, and protection. Preserve and bless this day Joseph, our president, Tony, our governor, and all authorities serving in Congress and in our courts so that we may gather your church peacefully and worship you in fullness. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, stretch out your healing arm on all your servants today who are sick and hospitalized, including Joel, Judy, Siegfried, David, Ruth, Orpha, Marilyn, Elaine, Helen, Beverly, Carol, Andy, Edward, Asher, Randy, Bruce, Marion, Iwona, Rich, Dakota, Marlene, Elmer, and the families of Geraldine Short, Schultz and Matt Brunn. Restore them in all fullness according to your eternal will, and give them the consolation which only you can provide. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of love, you established marriage before the fall as a special gift to man and woman. We give you thanks for the gift of marriage to Mike and Enoch for 53 years. Defend them, bless them, and keep them faithful to the end that they may reflect your love through their love. Lord, in your mercy. God most high, you have graciously established Trinity Lutheran School as a place of learning and discipleship, all for the sake of your kingdom. Continue to build up our school for that most holy purpose, that our next generation may be fully acquainted with you and dedicated to your truth. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on all us today. Though our sins be many, 
Wash them all away in the flood of your precious blood shed for us on the cross of Calvary, so that we may remain blameless in your sight. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that in all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, hymn 655. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Please be seated. Well, it's good to see each and every one of you here this morning as we gather around God's Word. A best special thanks to all of our uh, musical performers, our choir, our youth brass choir, our organist, and our children and their teachers. It's good to hear uh, us make a joyful noise unto the Lord. A couple of announcements. We got a voters meeting immediately following in the basement. You're welcome to join us today at 11. Our trunk and treat is this Thursday. Uh, 5 to 6.30, so bring your kids to come and trick-or-treat. If you want to donate candy, you can. Or if you want to come and hand out candy uh, uh, out of your trunk, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, be here at 4.30 to park and get your vehicle all situated. Any other announcements? And so if you didn't hear in our prayers, we, uh, Mike and Enos celebrated their 53rd wedding anniversary. What day is it, Mike? Wednesday, this past Wednesday. So thanks be to God for, for 53 years of marriage to Mike and Enid. Yes. Uh, let... All right. Let's conclude with the Bible verse of the month. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. God's blessings to you this week.